Uh, thank you all for coming out today. Such a beautiful day in San Francisco. I was raised here in San Francisco, and um, I know what fog is like. <laughs> well, today we're going to talk about diabetes. And what's really wonderful about diabetes is that it can be reversed in some cases. And uh, that's what we're going to talk about. The American Diabetes Association, most registered dietitians, most doctors who treat diabetes are going to want to restrict sugars and fast-releasing carbohydrates, and they're thinking that this is somehow going to make diabetes go away, and it doesn't work, does it? Diabetes is not going away. With a normal medical treatment, it just gets worse. But we also need to avoid saturated fats, and that's something I'm going to tell you more about today, and it might be something new for you. I've done a lot of original research on this, and it's kind of exciting, because what is type 2 diabetes? It's insulin resistance. The insulin is put when your blood sugar goes up, the insulin's released from the pancreas, and that allows the blood sugar to be pulled into the muscle cells and the brain cells and the liver cells and everywhere else. But if you have insulin resistance, then the blood sugar stays too high, and that's pretty much the definition of type 2 diabetes. Now, we're all going to experience some high blood sugar from time to time. That sugar rush is a lot of fun, and it's hard to avoid. So we need antioxidants in our diets to protect our bloodstream, our nerves, our eyes, our kidneys, and all the areas that sugar can damage. The way it works is the sugar reacts with a protein inside our arteries. It's called glycation, and it performs this kind of nasty thing that becomes advanced glycation end products, which really stick with you for a long time. The A1C test is a test for glycated hemoglobin. So, three ways to beat diabetes. Eat slow-releasing carbohydrates, like oatmeal and brown rice, like beans, like the carbohydrates in vegetables. These are slow-releasing. And stay away from animal fats. Animal fats are usually very saturated. And that would be cheese and meat would be two examples of animal fats. Uh, obtain your fats from whole nuts, seeds, avocados, or olives, whole intact foods. I do have a book on fats and oils on my website, drsteveblake.com. If anybody wants to read a really fat book on fats and oils and their effects on health, you can download it for under $10. It's a little bit fat to print, so it's downloadable only on that one. I think you know what diabetes is. It's high blood sugar. They'll test it, your blood sugar directly in milligrams per deciliter, and if it's over 100, up to 130, it's usually called prediabetes. Then if it gets over 130, that becomes full-blown diabetes. The A1C test is more accurate, and if it's over six, then it's generally regarded to be diabetes, and under six, better, but uh, rarely perfect. Another thing that's interesting about diabetes is that when you finish your meal at night and you go to bed, the blood sugar from that meal is going to be all used up within hours. In the morning, you wouldn't wake up if your liver didn't produce glucose. Think about it. You wouldn't wake up. So livers produces glucose. There's a process called gluconeogenesis where the liver creates sugar puts it into the bloodstream. This is done all the time, but in diabetes, the liver can be insensitive to the levels of blood sugar already in the bloodstream and continuously make blood sugar. And that's something that keeps the blood sugar elevated all day and all night. And that, of course, is what we're trying to not do. 29 million Americans have diabetes. I mean, just look at the food available out there. You know, if you go to a quick stop or a uh, chain restaurant, you'll see why people have diabetes, because it's all quick-releasing carbohydrates and saturated animal fats. Unfortunately, some people don't get diagnosed early enough. So if you're getting up in the night more than two times, you really should check with your doctor. It's called polyuria, and it's one of the early signs of diabetes. It could be another cause, of course, but it's good to get it checked. So get your blood checked. Make sure you don't have it. Uh, and if you do, listen up. I've got some great ideas on reversing diabetes. 
You know what would be interesting to me? Um, I wonder how many people in the audience today do not have diabetes. Could you raise your hand if you don't have diabetes? Wow, that's, you know, that's really an impressive number of people. Um, I work at Hawaii Pacific Neuroscience, and it's rare to see an elder come in, I guess with neurologic diseases, all of them, uh, who does not have diabetes. And it's unusual. So you're doing great already. Uh, let's keep it up. Type 2 diabetes is the main type of diabetes. Type 1 diabetes is when you're, you're born or in childhood. You don't have the ability to make much insulin. Type 2 diabetes is insulin resistance. <sighs> yeah, there's a lot of bad effects. Damage to arteries can increase the risk of heart attacks five times. And of course, that same damage to the arteries by high blood sugar can lead to amputations of toes and feet and fingers, and nobody wants to, to go there. Uh, blindness from diabetic retinopathy is really common. This is the bad news part of the talk. Uh, kidney damage happens especially from free radical damage from advanced glycation end products. Now, a lot of good antioxidant plants are going to help with that. The risk of Alzheimer's disease is higher with diabetes really fascinating tie-in is that there's an insulin degrading enzyme in the brain. It's the only one that can break down amyloid peptides before they become amyloid plaque. But if all the insulin degrading enzymes are busy degrading insulin, excess insulin is part of type 2 diabetes, then you're likely to build up more amyloid plaque and have more Alzheimer's disease. Well, let's find out how not to do this. We've heard a lot about insulin, just a, a brief refresher. When your bloodstream has too much sugar, the beta cells in the islets of Langerhans and the pancreas release insulin. Insulin is a hormone. Hormone then circulates around the body and it looks for insulin receptors which are located on muscle cells and many other types of cells in the body that need energy, that, that burn sugar. Insulin also tells the liver to stop making blood sugar. As I mentioned, if the liver is insensitive to that through an excess of animal fats or coconut oil, which also is very heavily saturated, twice as saturated, in fact, as lard or butter, this insulin resistance will cause the liver to make sugar all the time. And that's a big contributor to why when you measure your blood before a meal to check your blood sugar, why it's still too high. Insulin also causes fat to be stored telling your body, burn the sugars, don't burn the fats. A recent study came out. This is 2016. I just, you're the first ones to see it in the slideshow. They analyzed 300 clinical trials involving over 100,000 adults and um, 1.4 million patient months of treatments. That's a big meta study. Limited evidence that any glucose-lowering drug prolonged life expectancy, or prevented cardiovascular disease. I mean, this is the medical establishment, a journal of the American Medical Association itself, their own journal, uh, who are saying that diabetes drugs are really not protective against death or heart attack. So we need to do more, and that's what I'll talk about today. Uh, we get a break. This is my wife uh, and a Jenniker. We had the pleasure of sailing for five and a half years on our sailboat, and um, this is just a breath of relaxation before I go on. <laughs> Jenniker means light wind sailing, always a favorite, uh, at least for us older sailors. So I want to talk about saturated fat for a little while. Uh, saturated fats, the ones that are especially bad are lauric, myristic, and palmitic acid. There are three of the most common saturated fats in animal products, and they make up 65% of the fat in coconut oil as well. So these, the insulin receptors on the muscle cells become fewer in number when you take excess saturated fat. So if you eat a lot of meat, you're going to have less insulin receptors on your cell. How many less? Half the number. So when that insulin is circulating around looking for an insulin receptor to dock to, it's going to find a lot less of those, which means less of your blood sugar will get into your cells where it's needed for energy, right? Because people with diabetes are typically tired because they can't get the blood sugar in the cells where it's needed. 
And instead, the sugar's running around damaging the eyes and the blood circulation, the nerves, and, and all of that. The average American eats three times as much saturated fat as, un, as unsaturated fat, and that's because the average American eats a lot of animals. You notice that I have these citations at the bottom of each of my slides. Uh, this is the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. You'll notice that everything I say is science-based and based upon peer-reviewed medical literature. Vegan diet, cut diabetes risk, right down the line. Um, Non-vegetarian risk, semi-vegetarian, pesco-vegetarian with fish, lacto-ovo-vegetarian with milk and eggs, and then vegan. So the, the risk is much lower. Why do some vegans have a risk? Well, it would be easy to get too much saturated fat with one tablespoon of coconut oil a day which contains about 12 grams of saturated fat, and the maximum per day, according to the Heart Association, is 11. So it's really easy to go over. It's really easy to go over with meat and cheese, which are typically how most Americans get too much. So even a, a vegan person could get too much saturated fat and too much fast-releasing carbohydrates, and believe it or not, some vegans don't eat enough vegetables and fruits and antioxidant-containing foods. That's why I like to say a whole food plant diet rather than just vegan. Um, vegan involves a lot of ethical issues too, which are awesome, and I'm totally an ethical vegan and dedicated to all that, but the whole food part of it is good for human health, so I want to emphasize that part of it. So I, I mentioned this, that the insulin receptors in the cell membranes are cut by half. Excess saturated fats also raise blood sugar, um, I'm going to show you a little diagram that I made to try and explain this, but the way it works is there's a little glucose transporter that floats up to the cell membrane and gathers the glucose and brings it inside the cell. Once it's inside the cell, one of the things our cells can do is pack the glucose by the thousands into glycogen, which is a molecule that holds energy. Now, muscle cells really like to do this, so when you start running, you're, you don't really need blood sugar for a long time because you've got this stored blood sugar right there. Now, uh, this is a little diagram I made. With less saturated fat, the insulin goes and docks on the insulin receptor. Here's a cell membrane. And then the insulin receptor substrate locks on, and this PI3K is phosphatidylinositol 3 kinase. That'll be on the quiz. And then protein kinase B, and then this glucose transporter goes up and drinks in the glucose. That's how it's supposed to work. But if you're eating too much saturated fat, what happens is there's half as many insulin receptors, and when the insulin docks on those few receptors, there's an interference with a receptor substrate locking onto it. There's an interference in the phosphorylation all along through this machinery. I'm only showing a couple of the steps. And then the glucose transporter does not get into the cell membrane, so the glucose stays in the blood, and you stay exhausted, tired, hungry, and fat. This, this is not how we want it. So we just have to you know, do both things, not eat too many fast carbohydrates and not too much saturated fat. One other thing that excess sat fat does is it can kill off the beta cells that make the insulin. So it's better to start sooner as a diabetic rather than later because you need a few beta cells left to make your own insulin. Now, I don't know if you read the news, they just made an insulin pump for people with type 1 diabetes and it's, every five minutes it senses how much glucose is in your bloodstream and squirts a little insulin in. It sounded good until two days later the thing had been hacked. Jeez. <laughs> That's even worse than your Jeep Cherokee getting hacked. So it really is easier to start early, but no matter how advanced the diabetes, these techniques I'll mention will be helpful. And even in type 1 diabetes, you probably still need insulin, but you may need less insulin, and that's helpful too. Uh, when diabetes is diagnosed, half the insulin-producing cells may already be gone, so we want to preserve the ones that are there. And some of those beta cells aren't really dead. They're just not responding well. So we can get those to respond better, you, then you can make a little more insulin and regulate your blood sugar better. Obesity is one factor in insulin production and in diabetes. When I have crowds of people who are all diabetics, I look around and it, half the people are skinny. So it's, there is this commonly accepted thing that you have to be 
you know, heavy to have diabetes. It's not true at all. You need a fatty liver, but you don't need to be actually fat. Excess sugar, okay, this is a big surprise, isn't that? A real newsflash. Excess sugar, like this bottle contains 12 teaspoons of sugar. Um, it's no surprise that it does. When the sugar is raised in your bloodstream, the liver can take excess sugar and make it into one thing, and that's palmitic acid. Palmitic acid is a 16-carbon saturated fat that is famous for atherosclerosis. So the more sugar you take in, it raises your heart disease risk. That's why you have five times the risk of heart disease for diabetics. Ah, here's another break. Another calm day. There's a study done by Brenda Davis. And has anyone here heard of Brenda Davis? She's a registered dietitian. She's awesome. And um, we collaborated on the slideshow. Um, I sent her the parts that related to her slideshow, and she approved all of this as being accurate for her study in the Marshall Islands. At the beginning, the blood sugar was 236. Now, most Americans aren't allowed to let their blood sugar get that high, although I've seen it plenty. Um, but this, as an average blood sugar for the 30 participants, that's really high. But after two weeks, it went down to 161. That's 75 points less. So, for instance, if yours was a more reasonable 175, which is, would be a typical controlled diabetic level, and you lowered it by 75, it'd go to 100, and you just about graduate to non-diabetes, non-prediabetes. So this program worked really, really well. They lost weight, they lost cholesterol, their triglycerides went down, the people were healthier in, in many ways in two weeks. That's not very long, is it? So if you were to try an anti-diabetes diet, you really don't need to do it for more than two weeks if you go all the way, if, if you do everything. Um, medications after two weeks, the three people on insulin were no longer needing to take insulin, other blood sugar, lowering drugs like metformin, 27 were on them, only five at the end of the study still needed to be taking these blood sugar lowering medications. So this is, it blood, look at this, cholesterol drugs, the statins, 12 out of 13 drop their statins, high blood pressure drugs, 10 out of 11 drop their high blood pressure drugs. I think one person was cheating here and going to the donut shop, what do you think? <laughs> Neil Barnard did a five month study on a plant-based diet and his initial blood readings were 163, and then after 22 weeks, there are 128, just breaking below the diabetes barrier. Uh, people lost weight, their cholesterol went down pretty significantly, and, and they did a lot better. There are many trials that have shown that you can reverse diabetes, but it takes a complete change in diet because it's diet that makes the diabetes, and it's diet that makes the diabetes go away. They should call it diet beaties. Uh, another diet, a 600-calorie diet. We normally take in about 2,000, so 600 is really a light diet. But blood sugar went from 165 to 106, and the beta cells were revived and able to produce more insulin. Liver insulin sensitivity was restored, so the liver wasn't making sugar all day long. So this, in one week, pretty amazing, isn't it? This is why bariatric surgery, stomach bypass surgery is so effective is because you cut down the calories, this constant input of calories, and it helps. This study was done with a Nestle drink and um, some vegetables, and it wasn't a real healthy, sustainable thing, but it proved a point that you can change these blood sugar levels very quick. Now, some people are more prone to diabetes than others. American Indians, Hawaiians, Marshallese, various races are more prone, some are less prone, doesn't matter. Any race, any genetics on the planet, when fed the type of diet I'm going to describe, is going to not have diabetes, not going to develop diabetes. And if they have it, it's very likely to reverse it to the extent that their beta cells can still produce insulin. Risk of getting diabetes in this study in the New England Journal of Medicine, another very prestigious journal. Poor diet, obesity, lack of exercise, and smoking accounted for 91% of the risk of diabetes. So, obesity is related to a poor diet, and lack of exercise is too. 
Because if, if, have you ever noticed that when you have a bunch of plant-eating people around, they don't even sit down? They're always moving and standing up. Um, but the average American is headed straight for that chair, preferably a barca lounger, because exhaustion comes with the diet. Ah, we get another eye break. <laughs> That's my wife, Catherine, relaxing on sojourn. The Diabetes Wellness Project, project they reduced saturated fats, quick carbohydrates were eliminated, and protective dietary antioxidants were greatly increased. These are the basic three steps. So there's 10, 11 steps that I'll walk you through that they did, and you can do these. This, I am not a medical doctor. I'm a research scientist. I just finished a clinical trial at Hawaii Pacific Neuroscience where I work on Alzheimer's disease, and we beat it with nutrition. The, uh, the mini mental state examination went from 19 to 29 on average over nine months. So people just entering into dementia are now thinking and remembering as clearly within one point of normal, normal completely. Refined carbohydrates, you know this, you really shouldn't eat white flour junk, okay, hardly worth mentioning. Do um, you like this picture? I, uh, <laughs> I thought this, how many teaspoons of sugar do you think is in this one? Uh, sugary drinks, uh, white rice is a big problem in Hawaii and many places. Uh, I know there's one study in China, a huge study on white rice, and they found the risk of stroke dropped 80% when people switched to brown rice. That's a big effect. This lady, Marie Madison, when I joined, I could not lift my hands above my head without significant pain. I am now pain-free. My cholesterol and triglycerides have dropped to normal. My sugars are almost normal, too. I've lost weight. I feel like a new person. I'm now off all medications. It's unbelievable. I spent some time in the Marshall Islands not related to this study, and they're just sweet people down there, really nice. These are also carbohydrates, but you wouldn't think it to look at it, would you? The way this food releases its carbohydrates is slowly, bit by bit, and that's how we're designed. If we eat this kind of food, we'll get a little carbohydrates after we finish the meal, not a sugar rush, a little carbohydrates. Our muscles, our brain will burn that out of the bloodstream. A little more will release into the bloodstream, we'll burn that up, a little more, a little less. You may not even need any insulin to come out of your pancreas when you eat this kind of food. It's self-regulating. You get the blood sugar as you need it. Does anyone know the difference between glycemic index and glycemic load? There's a big difference, and it leads to a big problem. Glycemic index measures how, much, how fast the sugars are released. For instance, with watermelon, the sugars are released very quickly. So doctors tell you don't eat any watermelon and pretty much every other fruit, too. But when you go to glycemic load, they consider how much sugar is in the watermelon as well as how quickly it releases, and all of a sudden, watermelon's looking really safe. It's almost all water, and there's very little sugar. And it's really healthful. It has some nice antioxidants in it, and a lot of other fruits, too. So what this leads to, by using the wrong scale, the glycemic index, doctors are telling and registered dietitians are telling people not to eat fruit. And fruit is where you get a lot of your best antioxidants. I'll show you a chart of the best fruits coming along here. Watermelon's a great treat. I made this chart up for people we see uh, because fruit's so crucial. Uh, the berries. Did you know that one cup of berries a day in the Nurses' Health Study, ran for 19 years, reduced the, the age of dementia by two years? So people's brains... Well, I don't know if reduce the age of dementia really says that correctly. People's brains were two years younger, and they got dementia two years later, is what I mean to say. Uh, just with one cup of berries. So people with diabetes, of course, are counseled to eat no fruit at all. What's going to cut down the antioxidant protection dramatically to the brain and every other tissue in the body? So these are very low on the glycemic load index and can be eaten. Mango and banana are medium, and you'd have to restrict the amount of those if you're actively diabetic. Perhaps after you beat your diabetes, you might be able to eat a little bit more. Diabetics check their blood sugars regularly, so they know which foods are knocking them up. This was an interesting one. Fruit, but not fruit juice, was found to lower the risk of diabetes, and blueberries lowered the risk the very most down here. 
Blueberries are truly a wonder food for the brain and for diabetes and a lot of other things. But all the berries are great. They have proanthocyanidins, powerful antioxidants and anti-inflammatories, proven to cross the blood-brain barrier and lodge in memory areas like the hippocampus and protect it. This is Lorac Lorac. His pilot's certificate was revoked when he had type 2 diabetes. Only 38 years old, he completely changed his diet and he did exercise too. And he was told he's fully recovered. His pilot's medical certificate was given back to him. His fasting blood sugar is below 90 with no medications. That's just excellent. He's got his career and his life back. Number four, high fiber diet. And we're not talking about that. Even 20 to 35 grams of fiber that is normally recommended, but more fiber. <laughs> fiber improves blood sugar control. Uh, that's why fruit, but not fruit juice, lower the risk of diabetes, because the fruit has a lot of fiber that slows the release of the sugar as it's slowly digested a little at a time in the bloodstream, whereas the fruit juice just impacts the bloodstream right away. Uh, viscous fiber is nice, like oatmeal, and uh, we, this morning we had soaked oats. So last night we just put some water in some oats, let them sit out overnight, and in the morning put in some fruit, and it's a pretty easy way, uh, no messy pots, and I think it tastes better than cooked oats, but you, you can only use rolled oats. You can't use harder oats. You have to soak them longer. There are low-fiber foods like refined carbohydrates, white flour, white rice, most of the packaged junk that you'll find in stores, and then zero-fiber foods, meat, poultry, fish, dairy products, and eggs, sugar, and oil. Sugar and oil are similar in that all the fiber is removed and most of the other good nutrients, too. So... Avoiding those foods is part of the program, and it might be shocking at first to think about not using any or hardly any oil, but uh, my wife's cookbook, uh, Healthy Recipes for Friends, we have some on the table. She describes how to cook uh, delicious food without using any or maybe just a tiny bit of oil. <laughs> this kitty's definitely eating too much fat. Uh, High-fat diets, they, they increase oxidative damage and contribute to insulin resistance. And, of course, it's hard to lose weight when you're eating fatty foods. Um, total fat should be maybe 20 to 25% of calories. How do you know? I wrote a dietary software called The Diet Doctor. Uh, we have one on the table. And this software you put in your computer, you tell it what you ate in a day and how much, and it calculates for you what your saturated fat levels were what your protein levels were. Did you get enough calcium? The other day I checked myself, I only got 435 milligrams of calcium. I'm supposed to get 1,000. So it's a really good thing to check and make sure you're getting everything you need. And of course, keeping saturated fat down means animal fat is out completely. Because really, the American Heart Association is now down to 5 or 6% of your calories as saturated fat. I'm a strict vegan, and I get 4% of my calories from saturated fat. You know, there's a little in peanut butter, and there's a little here and there and different things. And if you eat much chocolate, well, I can bump it up to 5 um, if I'm not careful. So basically, if you add any meat to a vegan diet, the saturated fat is likely to go over the limit. Very, very likely. So coconut products would be part of that too. Coconut oil especially, and coconut milk is pretty rich. And you know, I think one-fifth of a can of coconut milk is all you can tolerate in saturated fat in a whole day. So you really can't have a lot of Thai food if you have diabetes or heart attacks or stroke risk. Where does it come from? Hamburgers, beef, spam, cheddar cheese, milk, butter. And there's your maximum of 11. Um, you really, you can't beat diabetes and eat animal products at the same time, in, in my opinion. Um, and anyway, you could try it, and if it didn't work, you'd actually be saving money anyway. It's so another lady. When I joined the program, I was very skeptical. Look at her. Doesn't she look like she could be skeptical? The cramps in my legs disappeared, and I no longer had to get up during the night. My sugars kept dropping and are now normal without any medications. My last lab test showed that I'm no longer diabetic. People can hardly believe what happened to me. And in this program, they had exercise and lectures as well as showing people how to buy at the store and prepare healthy meals. 
And the meals were served right there, so they weren't as tempted to go out and get some, you know, donuts or whatever. Trans fats are avoided on this diet, too. Trans fats, now people think of trans fats, they think of partially hydrogenated oils, like potato chips and things. But a lot of the trans fats come from both beef and dairy products because the cows make hydrogenation in their rumen and then they get trans fats in their bodies, in their milk, and humans get it from that too. It can vary from 21% to 60% of the trans fats come from dairy products and beef as opposed to partially hydrogenated fat. It depends what you eat. Omega-3 fatty acids are really the only essential fatty acids that humans really need. We also need the omega-6s, but we, since we all get too much of those at all times, really the omega-3s are the only ones we need to keep track of. And um, you could eat flax seeds. Uh, that's one good way. Ground up flax seeds is a good way to get it. Chia and hemp seeds also work. Perilla seeds are excellent. They're as good as flax seed. And walnuts have omega-3s too, as long as they're fresh enough. I read science all the time, and it's, it, I just read a study this morning, and it was, the risk factor was 1.47. Wow, that's a high risk factor. The risk factor for eating fish and getting diabetes is 38 times, as in 3,800% risk. Why is that? It's a polychlorinated biphenyls and the polybrominated diphenyl esters. These things go into the pancreas and kill off the beta cells. And so you can't make insulin anymore. Uh, fish is usually the highest source of these. Uh, I have graphs of this stuff. So eating fish might not be a good idea if you're trying to beat diabetes, which is interesting because I'll bet your doctor never told you to avoid fish. And yet, this is from Diabetes Care, 2008. It was a really good study. And I have read, reread, and sent the study off to colleagues to try and find fault with it. And it, it seems to hold up. In fact, I've seen even higher estimates. Yes? Is this also like wild versus farm? Does it matter? Unfortunately, the environmental toxicants that we're talking about, those PCBs and PDBEs, they're ubiquitous in the environment. So wild Alaskan salmon, farm fish in England, all of it has it, and there's just no way around it. A hundred years ago, no. But now these persistent organic pollutants are persistent. Good question, though. Fish oil, by far the largest source of these. Fish number two, eggs, dairy, baby foods. Kind of heartbreaking, isn't it? Um, beef, vegetable, but look, fruit, vegetables, and cereals, this little line here, virtually none. So eating lower on the food chain, that's the key. Plant antioxidants are crucial to any way. If you're trying to beat diabetes, you really need plant antioxidants. They decrease the tissue damage. This tissue damage can be inside your arteries. It can be in your eyes. It can be in your kidneys. It can be in, in your circulatory channels, in your fingers and toes. And really good idea to eat. You know, it's interesting that animal products don't contain any antioxidants. It's a generalization, but I believe it's true. And plants, almost all of them have some antioxidants because plants have to defend themselves against the sun just like we do, and so they make these antioxidants. Some, like blueberries, make a lot more. Standard American diet, when you look, this is a readout from my diet doctor software. The vitamin C was low. It should be here, but it was only here. The vitamin E, another powerful antioxidant, should have been here as a minimum, 15 milligrams, but it was only this tiny amount. If you switch to a whole plant-based diet, look, the vitamin A is way more than you needed, mostly carotenoids. The vitamin C is excellent. The vitamin E is more than you need. So the antioxidants on a plant diet are much higher than on an animal diet. And there's a picture of the antioxidants themselves. Color's a good way to go. Vegetables and fruits, nine servings a day. This is more than the USDA recommends. Legumes, two servings a day. Any kind of nuts or beans. Um, a small amount of nuts and seeds, not a huge amount. You need your vitamin E, but you don't want to get too much fat in your diet, especially if you're recovering from diabetes. Once you've recovered, then you can maybe eat 
two servings of each if you need that much. And whole grains, three servings a day. I'm going to talk more about grains. What about antioxidant supplements? You should not depend on supplements for your antioxidants. We should all get them from food. That's the best way and the only way. But on the other hand, some days I don't get enough of one antioxidant or another. And we have our own antioxidant systems in our body. Superoxide dismutase, glutathione peroxidase, catalase. We have enzymes in our body that detoxify these like superoxide radical that will really damage our tissues. And that's the mode of action of diabetes damage to the retina, to the kidneys. That is it. And that's what we can defend against. This particular supplement, the brain and body food, I made for people who couldn't be in our clinical trial but wanted to get the nutrients in our clinical trial to fight Alzheimer's disease. But it is basically a multiple, and I just take it as a multiple, and you can too. We have a few bottles, three bottles, with us. Uh, vitamin C is a powerful antioxidant, fruits and vegetables. Vitamin E, you have to eat some fatty foods to get vitamin E, and the healthiest would be nuts, seeds, and avocados. And vitamin A should be gotten from carotenoids, which are antioxidant, instead of the animal-based uh, retinal palmitate that is not an antioxidant. Then there are things in the diet that make you sicker. And on this program, people were encouraged not to eat these. Sounds like the Blue Angels are still at it. Food contaminants like pesticides, hormones, heavy metals, PCBs, DDTs, dioxin. I mean, this is a whole lecture in itself. Oxidized fats, when you overheat fats, especially when they have several double bonds, they will go rancid, create malondialdehyde and increase cancer risk. Also not at all good for diabetes. Pro-inflammatory molecules are advanced glycation end products. These are formed when meat or fish are broiled, barbecued, or fried until they're brown. These AGEs form. And the odd thing is that some chefs are taught that they, since they taste good, you should make more of these AGEs, but they are virtually impossible to get out of the human body. And they're one of the contributing factors to Alzheimer's disease as well as the main factor for increasing free radical damage to the kidneys and diabetes. So good to avoid those. Um, and then there are heterocyclic amines and acrylamides, high temperature cooking. Maybe some of the uh, raw fooders are a little closer to right than we thought because as you cook food, especially without water, you're in danger of forming molecules that are damaging. Uh, it's, it's better to cook with water than again without it. Now moderate salt was one of the, the parts of this. Salt's mostly found in packaged food. So if you're not eating a lot of packaged food, your salt's probably fine. Exercise is really important to, for diabetes. Now, the, the Marshallese people are wonderful, sweet people, but they're not real exercise buffs. Uh, it's kind of funny how I went down there and they had a 5K race. No, it was a 3K race. 3K is not very far. It's like a quarter mile race. And there are only about six participants in the race, the whole island of Majuro who wanted to run for a full three kilometers. And I had a five-gallon bottle of water, and I went up to the beginning line, and I said, where do you want the water? And they said, oh, at the finish line. So I carried the bottle of water to the finish line. After I was halfway there, they started running, and guess who won? I did, <laughs> with my five gallons of water. <laughs> so I'm just saying, it's a, it's a tropical climate where the temperature varies just a couple degrees the whole year, and you don't really want to move much. But exercise is super important. You all know that. Exercise to your ability. I'm 66. I'm still running. Not real fast and maybe not as far as some of you, but at least I'm still doing it. And it feels good to exercise too, for sure. Uh, participants reported this change in diet that their pain disappeared in their joints and their arms and especially in the legs. Cramps at night are often from magnesium deficiency. And this magnesium deficiency can cause cramps, it's well known, and the fruits and vegetables have so much magnesium that the cramps just go away. They didn't need massage. They had increased energy. They could walk further. And they didn't have to get up at, at night. And of course, the high fiber diet, we're talking 35 to 50 grams a day of fiber, constipation is no longer an issue. Now, I showed this graph, but I want to show you one more time 236 milligrams per deciliter went to 161. 
a huge change from extremely damaging to just over diabetes. They lost weight. Their cholesterol went down really quite a bit. I was surprised their cholesterol wasn't higher to begin with on average. And the triglycerides went down too. And this is only the first two weeks. So you can do it. You can reverse diabetes as long as you have a few beta cells left that can make insulin. And I showed you the medications, almost completely dropped off the chart. We have a guy in Hawaii, Dr. Terry Shintani. Has anyone heard of him? He is fantastic. He's a medical doctor. He has a nutrition degree from Harvard. He also has a legal degree, and he really knows his food. He does four times a year. He'll take people in, and he'll feed the people with diabetes and reverse their diabetes. And just about everyone in his program reverses his diabetes. There's a TV show, and the announcer asked, she had two of the people from the program on. She asked the first lady, how long did it take to reverse your diabetes? She said, no, it wasn't until the second week. <laughs> then she asked the first lady, she says, how long did it take to reverse your diabetes on this program? She said, at the end of the first week, I was off all meds and my blood sugars were normal. Is that amazing? Here's Fred Heine. He was in a wheelchair from a stroke. He did the program for six months, got rid of the wheelchair, is walking on his own, healthier than he's been in many years. The program gave him more hope than he ever thought possible. And it's hope, really, that you need. But you're going to need hope, and you're going to need every bit of inspiration I can provide you because changing your diet from, you know, meat and donut diet to a, a really nice plant-based diet like this is going to take discipline, and it's going to take a change in what's in your cupboards. It's going to be a change in what you order at restaurants. It's all doable. But I'm just saying it'll take some work at first. But once you see the results in your energy alone and how good you feel, and, of course, once you see your blood test, you're going to, you're going to want to keep it up. So just have a little faith. It costs you nothing for a couple of weeks. Those who continued the program continued the benefits. And as represented by this very attractive chocolate donut on the bottom, <laughs> those who fell off the wagon and ate the chocolate donut, they no longer had the benefits. They got their diabetes back. And yes, people in this program and all of the diabetes programs that I've looked at, some people will go back and some people will stick with it. So it is your choice what you want to do. If I could choose for all of you, it would be no more diabetes and none of you would ever have it. But you have to choose what goes in your mouth. All I can do is inspire you and educate you. And, and that's my job. And I take it seriously. So um, we've come to anchor here at a very peaceful anchorage. I believe this is somewhere up the Sea of Cortez. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. OK, we have a question in the front here. What about bitter melon? I have nothing against bitter melon except its flavor. <laughs> um, if you're looking at any one thing to cure diabetes, I don't think it's going to work unless you change your diet. I, I mean, fenugreek seeds are really good for, and cinnamon and all kinds of things are good for fighting diabetes, but you really need to, first of all, change that diet. And then you won't even need it. It's done, yes. Okay, she's asking about coconut oil. I know there's been a lot of press about coconut oil and how popular that is. I have a book on my website, drsteveblake.com, and it's, it's Understanding Fats and Oils, A Scientific Guide to Their Health Effects, and it's footnoted. So you can look at the studies that I use for that. I will explain to you in that book for under $10, a downloadable version, and you can look at uh, what the saturated fats are, which ones, Palmitic and myristic acid are not short chain or medium chain fatty acids, and yet they make up 25% of coconut oil and contribute to atherosclerosis, diabetes, Alzheimer's disease, and many other terrible things. Coconut oil not only has damaging components such as these saturated fats, 40% lauric too, um, but it has none, none of the good things that we want out of life. For instance, vitamin E. 
if we're eating anything oily, we want it to have vitamin E in it because that's one of the chief reasons we eat any oily food. Like walnuts, pecans, very rich in the gametocopherols. Excellent choice. But coconut oil, no vitamin E. There's only two nuts without vitamin E. Can anyone name the other one besides coconut oil? Macadamia. Very delicious nut, but no vitamin E. The reason is, of course, that coconuts don't need vitamin E because they have a husk and a shell to protect their seeds from the sun. But we need vitamin E. Uh, I have extensive research on coconut oil. Uh, <laughs> very extensive. All from the scientific literature. And if you, if you just research it from a non-Google source, you know, go to Google Scholar instead of Google. And you should find something to support that. She's asking if I ever eat coconut oil. I never eat coconut oil. We do grow coconuts, and I will crack them and drink the water, which is delicious and very healthful. Uh, and I will sometimes eat a little bit of coconut meat. But coconut meat, I figure I could eat half a coconut of meat once a week and just push my saturated fats over for that one day. The rest of the week I stay under. So, but the oil is very dangerous, and coconut milk is too. Uh, yes, sir? You. So if I'm talking to someone who has diabetes, okay, one, th one thing one of your slides mentioned was the possibility that the, uh, that the, the, uh, that the insulin generating cells could come back, right? I mean, is that something that I should hold out, out to them as a possible outcome, or is that something rare? Yes. He's asking about the beta cells. Can they regain their ability to make insulin? And the answer is yes. This has definitely been proven. Now, if they're truly dead, all of them, then no, such as type 1 diabetes. But if it's type 2 diabetes, and let's say there's 40% of your beta cells left, and 20% are still functioning and 20% are not functioning, this change in diet that I've discussed could allow the other 20% to function, greatly reducing your need for medications. And then if you eat food that actually put the blood sugar out little by little, like beans are wonderful. Beans are probably one of the best foods for diabetes, green beans or any kind of other beans. That really helps. So yes, I would hold out hope, and I've seen in the medical literature that this has been demonstrated, that the beta cells can get better. There's a form of toxicity that can be removed with this diet with a really long, complicated name. Right. Now, you're not going to regrow beta cells, but you might revive some. And that's exciting. Yes? Is, is the barbecuing of vegetables also bad? No. Barbecuing of vegetables is safe because they have water in them, and that interrupts the process of creating advanced glycation end products. Good question. Uh, way in the back. You. you How do you get rid of the toxins in the body? Well, the best way would be to quit eating them. The body does eliminate these things. The, the way they detect PCBs in the body is they, they do take a urine sample and they test it. They're being constantly excreted, but people are constantly eating them. Some of the tests for pesticides and, and persistent organic pollutants, like in children, they put them on an uh, organic diet and they stop putting out, you know, yeah, organic vegetables. Yeah, would, would be a good choice. Uh, yes, sir. What about uh, tofu? You didn't talk about that. Does that have uh, saturated fat? No. Actually, tofu has, like all beans, has a wonderful fat profile. In fact, tofu has a nice amount of omega-3s, which is pretty rare even in the bean family. Uh, tofu should be organic to avoid both GMO and, or, and pesticides. But when it is organic, it has some wonderful properties. And I know there's been some bad press put out by the Weston Price Foundation, funded by the meat industry, against soy products. And they did a really well-funded campaign and made a lot of people turn away from soy products. But in the scientific literature, all I see is that soy products have been related to uh, huge decreases in prostate cancer and breast cancer. Uh, really helpful in stroke risk, 80% less stroke risk with more soy products. So I'm not seeing any evidence that soy products are, are damaging, and, but I would recommend organic ones. Yes? Yeah, I, I do a lot of soy, and I get people who say, or particularly women, say, oh, the tofu and the soy milk contain estrogen. Mm -hmm. Could you please explain the difference between phytoestrogens 
Sure, I'd be happy to explain the difference between phytoestrogens found in soy and estrogen in the body. Probably the most cancer-promoting estrogen formed in the woman's body is estradiol, or estradiol. And this locks onto estrogen receptors in breast cells and can induce more breast cancer. The phytoestrogens found in soy, such as genistein and diazine, these two lock onto the same receptors, but they're vastly less powerful in causing breast tumors. So in a way, they're blocking that receptor from ever getting something that will cause breast cancer. One of the most convincing studies took a lot of women, it was a large study of women who'd already had breast cancer, had surgical removal of the breast cancer, and then followed them over many years to see, are they going to get this breast cancer back or not? The ones who ate soy did not get the breast cancer back, and the ones who didn't got much more of it back. Uh, I think we have time for only one more question, and yes, you get it. Right. What do you cook? What kind of oil do you cook with? Honestly, in my house, my wife has to sneak in a small bottle of sesame oil and use it when I'm not looking because I wrote this big book on fats and oils and rancidity. It's such a problem when you heat it. Uh, but she mostly cooks it using a little water. Sesame oil is probably a good choice because it has sesame, a heat activated antioxidant. And um, you have very, very little oil or none would be the optimum way. We use a cast iron skillet, requires almost no oiling and nothing sticks to it. So that's our solution. Well, I would love to stay with you longer, but I think we're a little bit out of time. Thank you so much, it's been really fun. Thank you. I'll, I'll be over the table with my publications and I hope you come over and join me, thank you.